a few videos ago, I introduced you to the concept of bond polarity, and it's actually been quite a while since we talked about this, so let's start by just reviewing a little bit. In this particular video, I was teaching you how to classify bonds as either nonpolar covalent or polar covalent or ionic. And the way that we would classify a bond as nonpolar, polar, or ionic was to compare the electronegativity values of the two atoms in the bond. So we said if the two atoms in the bond had a difference of electronegativity that was less than 0.5, we would classify that bond as nonpolar. And if the two atoms had a difference of electronegativity that was greater than two, we would classify the bond as ionic. And polar bonds would be between two atoms that had a difference in electronegativity that was somewhere between 0.5 and 2.0. And I did tell you in that video that these guidelines uh, were not agreed upon by all chemists, but these are a good starting point for general chemistry students to use for the purposes of classifying bonds. We also talked a little bit about how when we look at the periodic table, the trend for electronegativity is that it increases as we go to the right and also as we go up. So as we go towards fluorine, electronegativity consistently increases. If we're comparing the difference in electronegativity between two atoms that are side by side, the, they will probably have similar electronegativity and the difference in electronegativity between those two atoms is going to be very low. If we compare the difference in electronegativity between two atoms that are far apart from each other on the periodic table, the difference in electronegativity between those two atoms is probably going to be relatively high. We also talked about how you can look up the actual values of electronegativity if you want to know what they are, and you could use that to do actual calculations, which we did in that video. So in that video, we looked at some pretty simple bonds, such as these ones right here, and classified these types of bonds as being polar or nonpolar. We talked about how if we have a bond between two identical atoms, no matter what those two atoms are, the different in electronegativity between any two identical atoms will be zero. Um, fluorine's electronegativity just happens to be four. The difference uh, between four and four is zero, but it doesn't really matter what this particular electronegativity value is. It could be 27. The difference between 27 and 27 is always going to be zero. So because these two atoms are identical, their bond is nonpolar. I did uh, intentionally highlight hydrogen and fluorine when we were looking at the periodic table and I showed you how far apart they were from each other on the periodic table. Because they're very far apart from each other, they have a pretty decent difference in electronegativity which makes their bond polar. We also talked about dipole moment, which was just a way of representing the polarity of a bond. And I showed you two different ways to represent the dipole moment. I told you that you can draw a partial positive sign and a partial negative sign next to the two atoms in the bond. The negative sign would go next to the most electronegative element, and the positive sign would go next to the least electronegative element. Another way that we could represent the dipole moment was to simply make a plus sign next to the more positive element and then turn that into an arrow that points towards the most electronegative element. So this was two different methods that we had for representing the dipole or the polarity of a bond. Now let's transition all of that into a conversation about molecular polarity. When we're looking at a very simple molecule like HF or FF and that molecule has only one bond, the bond polarity is the same thing as the molecular polarity. So HF has a polar bond, it only has one bond and that means that it is as a whole, as a molecule, it is polar. And FF because it only has one bond, and that bond is nonpolar, the FF molecule is also nonpolar. But as soon as we introduce more than one bond into a molecule, we have to think a little bit more about assigning polarity to the overall molecule. We're still gonna follow the same process for assigning polarity to individual bonds, but once we get all of the bonds assigned a polarity, we have to think about how each of those different bonds interacts together to create the overall polarity of the molecule.
So here we have the first example, we have AlCl3. Now, if we look at the periodic table to look at aluminum and chlorine, we can see that they're actually pretty far apart, which means that this molecule, the bonds in this molecule are probably going to be polar, with aluminum being the more positive and the chlorine atoms being more negative. And if we wanted to draw a dipole moment for these bonds, because I think the dipole moment is very helpful to draw, I'm going to try to draw it right, right on top of the molecule, we would put the positive sign on the aluminum and draw that arrow towards the negative chlorine for each one of those bonds. Now, if you're really good with like math and vectors, this whole concept is about to become really easy to you. Once we've determined the polarity of each one of these bonds, we want to think about how all three of these bonds work together to create polarity or non-polarity as a whole for the molecule. Again, if you're good with vectors, this is really becoming a problem of just simply adding each one of these vectors. And if you add all of these vectors together, like I said, if you're good with vectors, you'll know that they sum to zero. Three equivalent vectors that are all just going to cancel each other out. If the whole idea of adding vectors is scary to you. We can do this without thinking about vectors also. We can really just kind of look at the symmetry. Imagine that this is like a three-way tug-of-war game where we've got three people that are all exactly of equal strength, all pulling at the exact same time in their respective directions with some sort of wonderful prize here in the middle. If all three of these people are of exactly identical strength and they're all pulling in the exact same way, this prize in the middle is not gonna go anywhere. Everybody's just gonna be pulling in a way and their efforts will all cancel each other out. This is sort of a way of trying to explain to you that the pull from this ALCL bond is gonna be canceled out by the pull of the other two bonds. And likewise, as we go around. When the bonds cancel each other out like that, even though the bonds themselves may be polar, the molecule overall is going to be a nonpolar molecule. So we could say that this is a nonpolar molecule with polar bonds. Now, just because we have multiple bonds and just because they're arranged symmetrically, that doesn't always mean that the molecule itself is going to end up nonpolar. So here's another example for us to look at, CH2F2. And let's just say, just for, you know, just to keep things simple, let's say that each one of these bonds is a polar bond. The carbon is the most positive of these, the hydrogen being partially negative and the fluorines are partially negative as well. And so we have dipole moments that look like this. And remember that this is a three-dimensional molecule. Um, so these two, the, the wedge bond represents a bond that's sticking out at us and the dashed bond represents a bond that's sticking behind us. These bonds are arranged symmetrical with respect to each other. And if they are all equal in terms of the magnitude of their polarity, we end up with another situation like this, where the molecule itself is overall nonpolar. But we have two different bonds, two different types of bonds in this molecule. We have the HF bond, which doesn't have very much of a difference in electronegativity. And then we have the excuse me, the CH bonds, which don't have much difference in electronegativity. And then we have the CF bonds that have a pretty big difference in electronegativity. And so for those bonds, I'm drawing big people. These are very big, strong people. So now we have a four-way tug of war with two very strong people pulling towards themselves in this direction and two little not strong people over here. And you can kind of imagine what's gonna happen in this situation with these very strong people are going to absolutely overpower the smaller people and it's gonna drag whatever we have here in the middle in this direction towards these strong people. Whenever we have this uneven distribution within the molecule, the molecule itself is going to be polar. So this is a polar molecule and it also has polar bonds. Now, if you can always think about this either in terms of summing up vectors, making sure that you're counting not just the direction, but also the magnitude, um, that's a great way to solve these types of problems. And also, if you could just think about it as a big game of tug of war, that also works as a way of solving these types of problems. So here we have a couple more examples that we're going to look at. We're going to apply the same sort of concept. In this particular molecule, the nitrogen is the positive molecule. The oxygens are the negative molecules. So the vectors go in this direction. And we've got, um, it doesn't matter if a bond is a double bond or a single bond or a triple bond. 
the difference in electronegativity is always the same. So we've got two equally strong people that are pulling in this direction. How do we take into consideration this lone pair? Well, I want you to think about a lone pair as like a vector of infinite magnitude or an absolutely gigantic human being. And maybe it's not a happy person. We'll make it angry. So the lone pair of electrons is extremely powerful in terms of factoring in the polarity of this molecule. So this is a vector with very, very intense magnitude or a very strong person. Because of that lone pair of electrons, this is a polar molecule, very uneven distribution of the electrons in the electron density in this molecule. What about over here? Again, we have two of these very strong lone pairs of electrons that are going to be pulling that molecule very much in this particular direction. So again, we have another polar molecule due to the presence of these lone pairs. And here's another example where we have this lone pair of electrons, even though we have... Uh, vectors pointing in all of those directions, this one vector with the lone pair, very overpowering, definitely cancels out those smaller vectors, which makes this a polar molecule as well. Let's look at just a couple more examples. Now these ones, things are going to get a little bit trickier. We're going to start with the one in the middle. So here we have these smaller vectors for the xenon fluorine bonds. And then we have this one big, huge giant vector due to the lone pairs, which makes this a polar molecule. But what about this one over here? So let's go back to drawing our tug of war. We have these four bonds and these four bonds are all if you can remember the way this molecule looks they're all 90 degrees with respect to each other and these are all going to be equal in terms of their magnitude so we've got four people of identical strength all pulling on each other and their strengths will cancel each other out but then we have this lone pair here and here and we've got two lone pairs they're on opposite sides of the molecule so we have one big lone pair pull in that direction and we have another big lone pair in the opposite direction so these two very strong lone pairs even though they're both pulling very hard they're pulling in perfectly opposite directions of each other and they will end up canceling each other out. So this molecule ends up being nonpolar even though it has lone pairs because the lone pairs are situated perfectly opposite each other which allows for them to essentially cancel each other out. And then last but not least, we have this molecule here, which is kind of a little bit tricky because you've really got to visualize where these three lone pairs are located. That's definitely going to be a variable here. One of them is pointing off in this direction, and then we have one of them that's pointing in front. So this is on a wedge. I'm going to try to draw it on a wedge. And then we have this one that's in the back, also on a wedge. And all of these are 120 degrees with respect to each other. So we have another situation where even though they're very powerful and strong, they're all situated in such a way that their magnitude cancels each other out. And then also these two magnitudes cancel each other out, and it leaves us with a molecule that is overall nonpolar.